right. All right. Well, thank you guys all for coming. We are back. MoFilm monthly meetups are back for 2022. So happy that you guys are all here. Um, I'm Andrea Sporsett Clund. I run the Missouri Film Office, and I'm here with my colleague, Steph Shannon, who works with the KC Film Office, but she is also with the Missouri Motion Media Association, who co sponsor these wonderful events. So I'm going to pass it to Steph for a few announcements to start. Good morning, everybody. Um, like Andrea said, I'm uh, the Vice President of Missouri Motion Media Association, and if you're not familiar, uh, we are the statewide advocacy and, and education organization that focuses on uh, the film, television, commercial production, motion media industry. Um, and the update that I want to talk to you about this morning um, is that we are currently seeking members we are currently seeking donations. We are currently seeking support because we have engaged with lobbyists uh, for several bills in the House and the Senate in Missouri to uh, working to pass a film incentive. And that's kind of a, the thing that's the game changer for our state. If we can have a film incentive, then we can be competitive with other states for um, work of all sizes, certainly independent film, but some studio projects and this would be uh, for episodic work as well as film work. So our bills kind of have two pots of money, one for episodic television, which as we all know, people are binge watching that kind of content like crazy. And we wanna be a part of that here in the state of Missouri. So that's what we're doing. Um, our website is momaonline.com. Um, and we're so proud to partner with Missouri Film Office to do these monthly meetups. They've been really successful in 2021, and this is the first one in 2022, so we're super excited. And on a personal note, I'm a huge fan and member of PBS. And so that kind of content is just unique and important and always is elevates, uh, elevates us in our lives and in our culture. And so I'm excited to be a part of this particular panel this morning. Thank you, Steph. Awesome. Um, new this year, we have sponsors for the um, content that we're doing on these MoFilm monthly meetups. And so this, and I have to pull up the screen for our wonderful sponsor. Um, our very first sponsor is uh, the St. Louis Film Office. Share the screen. Renee was unable to be with us because she is on a float at the Mardi Gras parade in St. Louis right now. How fun does that sound? So happy Mardi Gras, everyone. And this is contact information for Renee. Um, unlike Steph, who's full-time film commissioner in Kansas City, um, Renee wears two hats. So she does group marketing as well as the film office. Um, but our websites are connected. So the crew and uh, crew database and the location database, any St. Louis metro area locations on my site or on her site and her site on my site. So uh, that's Renee on the float. I wanted her to live be with us live from the float in Soulard, but she wasn't going to do that. All right. One other thing to uh, promote the True False Film Festival, if you have not been, it starts uh, on Thursday in Columbia, Missouri. It is one of the premier documentary film festivals. I'm not just saying that because it's in Missouri. It legit is um, cutting edge, best of the documentaries. And I think they're going on 15 years, 16 years, somewhere in there. So I will be there. I hope you will be there. Um, if you are, shout out me because there's people everywhere, but call me out. Let's hang out. So that's what happens at True Falls. Now we are going to have this wonderful panel discussion as I spotlight our folks. Um, one of the things uh, over the years we talk about um, where where we can put local Missouri content. And I have known that we've had these wonderful four um, public broadcasting connected stations in the state of Missouri. I have not ever spoken to all of them all at once. Recently, I have been able to, it's been great. Um, I can't talk and do this at the same time. <laughs> what am I doing? Um, please welcome, I'm gonna, um, I'm really not good at this. So sorry, you guys. We're fine. We're out of practice. We haven't done these since November. So there we go. 
that's what I wanted to do. Wonderful. So we, um, all of you, thank you, Steph, for the beautiful words about um, PBS and public broadcasting and how important it is to our individual lives and how important it is to our state to tell local stories. And that's what we wanted to talk to these program directors and pro the programmers for our four stations. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves um, briefly and tell you, uh, if you guys will tell us a little bit about your career path, like how, how you ended up doing what you're doing now in public broadcasting. Peggy, do you want to go first? Sure. Hello, I'm Peggy Goodfriend. <laughs> I'm with Nine PBS in St. Louis. Um, I'm actually the director of broadcast promotion with Nine PBS. Have been helping out with our programming team uh, for the last couple of years. Um, my career path is through commercial television. Um, I worked at, and it's actually on the adver advertising side. Um, I worked for Channel 30 in St. Louis for a while, and I worked for a sales uh, company called Telerep for about a decade off and on. Um, I had sworn off television and then saw <laughs> an opening um, with the public television station in St. Louis. And I thought, oh, that's good television. Maybe I'll rethink that. So um, I started with 9PBS on the underwriting team, but I am a super fan of programming. I've been with them 11 years. Um, so I have, since day one, have started working with the programming team. So. Um, I help out with programming. As my title indicates, I'm director of broadcast promotion. So I promote all of our programming. And um, that's the short story. That is a lot, a lot of hats there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Michael Murphy, would you introduce us? Uh, sure, um, I'm Michael Murphy. I've been at KCPT, Kansas City PBS since uh, I don't know. I started here in 1980, so I'm, I've been here a long time. <laughs> I started on the production side. I made I made shows and things for I don't know 25 years, and then I switched. And to you started the show. I started what? You started in the show. You oh yeah, I did one on air thing, but I don't usually <laughs> do that. And oh, uh, just one. But uh, yeah, just one. That was the Rare Vision series, but um, that was fun to make. So um, I didn't have a choice; it was forced on me. But anyway. Um, so I switched to programming in what, 2007. So I've been the programming director since 2007. Yeah. Long Great. time. Yes, wonderful. Thanks for being here. Uh, Michael O'Keefe, you wanna introduce? Sure, yes, my, my career path was very, very straightforward from college at University of Central Missouri and the traffic position opened up and I've been there ever since. And that was uh, 1982. So I was a student there in 1980, about the same time Michael was at KCPT. And just over the years, I've done a little bit of everything from on-air promotions to uh, programming, traffic, definitely. Currently in charge of programming and promotions, we do our program guide and our website and newsletters and so forth. So that is where I am. And, and uh, so I'm kind of entrenched in there. It's a small station and with just 13 people on the staff on the university. So, so many hats for everybody. Great. And Tom? morning. Uh, my name is Tom Carter with Ozarks Public Television and uh, wear two hats there, both as programming and production manager and uh, come largely from a production background. Been in broadcasting for 45 years, uh, 22 of those with Ozarks Public Television when a station came to Missouri State University uh, and at that point took on those two responsibilities. Prior to that, was in production in Cincinnati, Ohio, in news in Springfield, Missouri. And as part of those responsibilities and interests, uh, have always focused on local history, documentaries, things like that. That's something that our station uh, really emphasizes. So much of my responsibility is developing those or, or physically hands-on creating them. Uh, we do enjoy and uh, encourage local production and uh, we'll broadcast those from independent producers. 
awesome. That is what we're here to talk about. And, and this is exciting. Um, I get, uh, I think there's a lot of questions about like how, where to start and how to approach you guys and what um, specs are necessary. So I want to talk first about like what kind of content you've talked, touched on a little bit, but what kind of content are you seeking from outside versus what kind of content do you create from inside? Well, I think in some ways they overlap each other. Uh, you know, I mentioned local history documentaries. They'll seem to be very popular uh, with audiences. You know, where you live, stories about where you live, um, making a distinction. Um, not that we exclude uh, public affairs or uh, maybe news or issue kind of programming, uh, but what we have focused on and successfully ourselves and um, with others is again kind of these historical stories, uh, culture, history of the area and things. And we think it's important to document those before they disappear just naturally with history and time uh, to preserve those in that way. And then again, people seem like they always enjoy when we present those. So, um, but that's not to say that we're not open to other types of programming. Yeah, I think Tom's right on the money there, the local history, local arts. For us, it's just really good storytelling. Hopefully, you know, we'll look at anything. We probably do stay away from some of the more serious public affairs things just because it's a little more expensive to vet those out. So you submit us a show on, yeah. you know, some bad polluter. And I mean, I got to hire lawyers to look it over. So, so yeah, that kind of stuff gets a little more intense for us, but. Um, Local history, local arts. Um, we love that kind of stuff and we get quite a bit of it. So, Yeah, I can say that exactly the same for nine PBS in St. Louis. Um, the local history our viewers love. Um, I would say the, I mean, I can give you examples of some of our viewer favorites over the last few years um, or last couple of years. Uh, America's Last Little Italy, the story of the hill, that's been, that's done really well for us viewer wise. Uh, our viewers have loved it. We've used it for pledge, which a lot of times if there's a good local documentary with an accompanying book, DVD, we'll use it for pledge. It will get a lot of airtime and it will help us with fundraising and it will help the filmmaker, if they're involved with the book and et cetera. Um, we aired one recently, uh, the Black Artist Group, that was um, St. Louis um, International Film Festival film. Um, that was great. Again, local history, that was, you know, local history and art. So that was great. Um, a documentary about Casey 95 radio that's been a big part of the St. Louis community forever. Um, it was history. Um, the viewers loved it. Again, it was a great pledge thing for us because all the DJs came in and helped with live pledge. So it was actually a lot of fun for viewers and um, staff too. It was a good, good night and fundraising. Um, we aired a documentary about vintage vinyl. That was a big hit. Um, and they were all independent filmmakers. So they were all- you know, Another very good program that you all recently uh, completed and, and generously made available to us, Peggy, was the one about the USS Missouri. Yes. So what, what a wonderful story. Right. Reflection of very, you know, um, local engagement that's right and i'm proud to say we produced that so that was that was internally produced but okay. yes that was wonderful and i think michael and michael may have aired that as well or yeah we, we planning did to. Air that. Good thing. yeah, yeah. We, we don't really haven't uh, being a small station and and where we are we haven't really actively sought much independence and but we're open to it we've had a few uh, films beth pike had a had a couple on our air a few years ago mm -hmm. and every now and then we'll get a, a submission uh, we did one on the uh, jane powell done by leah in columbia and uh, a few other things but 
Uh, but I agree, history and local history and local arts programming is, it would be, be uh, really welcome, yeah. And Michael, where are you based, your station is? We're stationed in Warrensburg, Warren. but our tower is in farther to the east. So we basically cover the whole state side to side, almost from Kansas City's, the edge of Kansas City to the edge of St. Louis coverage area and dip down into the Ozarks a little bit up in northern Missouri, where otherwise you're watching Iowa public television, which is you know, still good, but <laughs> not us. You know, I think a nice example of this kind of larger than local history and also uh, a collaboration and effort between all the stations was back last August as the state mm -hmm. celebrated its mm -hmm. bicentennial anniversary. So we had a two hour uh, overview, highlights of the state's history and all of us gathered together to uh, really promote that and uh, celebrate that, make it available for everyone to enjoy and uh, also to access in the future. Definitely, that was a great, great program. It and was, Tom took the viewers, lead on that. Yeah, the viewers in St. Louis loved it. And that's another example, you know, people enjoy their history, you know, um, the history of uh, Illinois or Kentucky or any of the other adjoining states may not resonate as much with uh, our audiences. Very cool. Let's hop over to the, the specs. Like what, and I'm certain you guys have seen a lot of work, people come to you with work, and I think there's some official channels to do that, and then some maybe more casual ways to do that. Like what, how, how do people come to you? What is the way that they do that? And what specs are most necessary for you to even consider it for broadcast? Uh, well, Shall I just go first here? Go for sure. it. I think you have the most, you have an application process and all of that. We do now have an online application process and we have a new chief content officer who's been working on this. And uh, so films that come in and where you're looking for a partnership or you're looking for us to help in some way, um, we'll go through her, her, her name's Allie Hudson. And uh, films that are just finished that, you know, you're hoping for an air slot, um, I'll look at. So, um, and this has taken, this process has taken a while to work out because we've been shifting a lot of stuff and we're in the middle of a redo of all of our buildings. So or, you know, we're not even in the middle yet, we're just getting started. So, but we're finally about to break ground on that. And that's, that's caused a lot of turmoil around here for our normal flow of things. So um, I did put the link up to that online. I also put a bunch of links there to, uh, you know, producing for PBS and PBS stations and the kind of PBS rules. The Red Book is really useful. It lays out all kinds of, of um, you know, just requirements and not necessarily requirements I have to live with because, you know, your film comes in six minutes short or six minutes long. Maybe I can figure out a way to deal with that on my end. But if you want it going other places, it's not likely they'll tolerate that. So you're almost better off to make things to the right format to begin with, which I've had things that moved on from here over the years that had to be recut or had to have eight minutes taken out or whatever, because it didn't match the PBS specs. <clears throat> and the biggest issue there are the PBS underwriting standards. And so you want to look at that stuff too, because we try to live by that. We're not perfect. We probably walk a little thinner line than PBS would. But PBS is pretty tough about some of that stuff. So anyway, so there's links up there to the Red Book and there's links to producing layouts and links of shows and, you know, all the stuff that can kind of help you if, if, if you know, PBS is your end goal. So sometimes it's not. Festivals, I get it. Festival circuit is, is you know, a big deal. And, and then it's, you know, going back to recut for PBS. So or, or maybe your PBS station. I mean, yeah, definitely the, the specs are important for all of us. And yeah, locally we can work with timings, little things like that, but yeah. the funding funding mechanisms, you we want to be on above board with everything. Uh, okay. Yes, those technical specs are especially important. Um, most of the people that approach us uh, already are professional filmmakers of some sort. But there's also a lot of people that are beginning to do it for the first time. And so there's inconsistencies with the specs and things. Um, I really like Michael Murphy's idea. And I wish we were at that point. 
wish we were at a point of doing that um, online application and things like that uh, to work. We look for something that is finished and that's ready to go that unfortunately uh, with present staff size and projects we have underway, uh, we're really not in a position to develop. Yeah, I'm going to let you go. Oh, sorry. If you're not muted on in the audience, can you please mute? I'm trying to find who might that be. Oh, <laughs> except unfortunately it's Tom. Oh, <laughs> mute yourself there. Okay. There we go. I think you have to unmute on the bottom. There we go. Okay. There. You're good. All right. You were telling us good things about the inconsistencies and in the specs. So did it. Yeah. So largely we look for projects that are complete, uh, regrettably. We don't have an opportunity. People will approach us and they genuinely have a very good idea, the story they want to tell. And they may or may not genuinely have the resources to help pull that together. Uh, but starting a production, a co-production with someone from beginning to end, um, again, regrettably, is not something that we're in a, in a place to do right now. Yeah, I can, we're the same. Um... We are, if a finished film um, is what we're looking for, honestly, um, like all, I think I can speak for everybody where everybody has small staffs. So um, we're looking for a finished film that has followed the PBS guidelines. Uh, it's the right length. They, the technical specs have been followed. The easier you make it for the station to air it, the more likely it will air. Um, obviously we want, the content has to work with, yep. for the station. You know, we're, we're gonna review it for content first and then make sure all the specs are followed. If the specs are not followed, but we're interested in airing it, we will ask the filmmaker to make the changes. Um, a lot of time filmmakers come to us and say, well, will you edit? No, we're not going to, we are not going to edit your film for a lot of reasons. We don't want to um, change the content to what something you're not comfortable with. And we just don't have the staff to edit out independent filmmakers. Um, the other thing I would say is to provide a 30 second promo or trailer of the program when you send it in for submission. Uh, just plan on that. And I think somebody asked about audio specs um, earlier. I'm not sure if that was answered in the chat, but audio specs um, are, I think on our technical guidelines, we provide that information as well. When I say our, I mean nine PBS's technical specs. Yeah, I, I think we follow St. Louis and Springfield, definitely not looking to, we don't have the resources to help craft a film or put those things together, but certainly a finished program would be good. And I agree with Peggy that uh, promotion, you know, once you have the your work of art put together and it's done, you want to help get the word out as widely as you can. So video on your spots, any social media, descriptions, things like that. And someone did ask about closed caption. And so yeah, broadcasters are required yeah. to have closed captions on everything. And there's some affordable uh, folks who can help you. Mike, is that right? Rev.com, is that? I think it's, it's rev.com, yeah. A lot of people use that. We use a firm out of Lawrence for yeah. our stuff. But, yeah. but, but got it's gotten so much cheaper to have closed captioning done. You do have to have, for us at least, I think there's a size limit. Uh, small stations can get away without closed captioning, but yeah, uh, budget, still, does that yeah. still hold true, Michael O'Keefe? No, I think we, it's, it's, if there is, we it went away. Do it because we it's so cheap, we can do it. We're making sure right. the programs are accessible. And we don't do audio description provided on our programs. I don't think it's mandated the same way that closed right. captions are. It's not, and we don't do it either. Uh, we have done it in the past, the audio description uh, uh, services. 
uh, back when WGBH was running a pilot program and had grant funding to do things like that. We used to do rare visions with a descriptive service. And, uh, but it's expensive and nobody's doing it for free anymore. So we're not really able to afford that very often. So. I think it's important to mention uh, when we're working with producers who are not uh, submitting programs or programs that are not coming from uh, traditional broadcasts or public broadcasting distributors. We sort of set it in directly, but in these specs, one thing is length, because uh, a lot of times when a uh, production is put together for competition and things like that, there isn't any specific requirement really, but there are broadcast lengths that need to be observed. So a program that, that has a finished running time of 61 minutes or something um, doesn't work for us. So it would require some re-editing or something, but something to be aware of. Yeah, it makes it hard to get those odd links in and, and make them work. So I can, I mean, I can tell you the standard length is we're looking for 26, 46, 26 minutes, 46 seconds, or 56 minutes, 46 seconds. And that's so we can get our break in between programs in, uh, air promos, station messaging, et cetera. Um, I wanted to, um, add to what Michael O'Keefe said about providing promotional material. The other thing we always end up going back to producers for is a brief paragraph about what the, what the program is, so a description of it. And we use that in our programming guides in our weekly um, programming highlights, emails. We use it in a lot of places. And um, I think Michael mentioned social media too. If you have a social media plan laid out, share everything with us and we will use it. Yep. Great. How, uh, go ahead, Tom, go ahead. I was just gonna say in photos as well as with the written summaries yeah. and all that helps with the guide and, and highlighting programs. Right. Photos, you know, some, yeah. some key, key artwork, you know, of your primary characters, or if you have a nice, uh, something that can work vertically for a cover. If you really, if it's a really nice thing, sometimes that's how our, our contact is, our program guide contact is what it's called. That's sometimes how the cover is decided. What's, what art do we have this month? And if it's a local good show, then, then uh, that'd be more likely to be featured. It's great. No promises though, just as possible. Yeah. <laughs> And we're a little different than I think the other stations in that we do take on some projects that we partner on as co-productions. So sometimes if you pitch something to us, that we do work with some outside producers. We're in the middle of a co-production on Virgil Thompson right now that we've been in the middle of for nine years. <laughs> so some projects really stretch out. And uh, um, but, you know, we do them from time to time like that. When we, if we find the right one, we're working with a a British dock maker here in town right now on some climate stuff and uh, a gun piece. And so we're not afraid of those kinds of things, but we, you know, in the application process, we ask you to bring to the table, a, you know, a legitimate budget and in that kind of a situation and any ideas you have for how you're going to raise that money um, or, you know, are you expecting us to raise it? You know, we can sometimes work on that with you. We can raise some of it, but but that's a little harder road to get down for us. So we don't you know, have a lot of money for that. So but we did do do, we we do how, from time to time. Did we mention how funders are, are recognized underwriting and things so that uh, producers understand that? Please do, that um, was gonna be my next question about talking about the underwriting and any licensing and how that works. Yes, well, that, that's a little bit, some of that, uh, the detail of it, uh, I'm not as familiar with uh, our underwriting staff does uh, help with that, but I believe from Michael Murphy's at least experiences and Peggy's, maybe Michael O'Keefe too, that, that you all could more uh, accurately and succinctly provide that information. Yeah, I, you have to be, I was about to mention funding. So you, funding has to be completely transparent. We run into issues a lot of times where we're brought independent productions and are told that, um, you know, they were funded by the producer, but then we, 
notice that they weren't <laughs> yeah. figure out that they weren't. So you have to be clear about where your funding came from. As far as underwriting, it's or you know funding support acknowledgement. It's it's at the open and the close of of the program, and it's basically as far as underwriting messaging. It's who they are, what they do, and you know their how you can contact them, or it's your basic information. It's no, not, we're non-commercial. So anything that's promotional shouldn't be done. Um, or has the perception of high promotion. No, correct. No prices, no call to action, and uh, no comparative and, to other, other uh, outfits. Right, and all of that is in the red book that Michael Murphy mentioned earlier. It's laid out clearly, but you should also stay in touch with the station on that. Um, we can help. There are so many nuances and <laughs> it's tricky, um, but we, you know, we, we are beholden to FCC guidelines, FCC and PBS guidelines for public television stations. So it's not an arbitrary thing that we come up with. It's basically the law for us and it um we don't want to lose our licenses so we'll ever see the fines yeah and then and in all of that you can look at the, the content of your program too if it's a drama that's one thing but if you're talking about issues and so forth that's really important where funding comes from and and the perception of can you give us an example maybe of where the underwriting and you can make up make up things but like an example of where the underwriting they maybe the producer sure. thought it was transparent but it wasn't well if, for example maybe a travel log where where this outfit uh, sponsors the show and they go to different towns and unbeknownst to us they've gotten taken money from different businesses to include those businesses in the show that that's not good not good or, I can tell you one of PBS's key um, uh, bitching points is, is that when people who have put money into a show actually appear in the show. Hmm. So that's, they really pretty much will, and I can give you an example of that. We had a comment from a Senator uh, years ago in a show, and it turned out that same Senator had donated a thousand dollars to the foundation, which was known as Orphans of War, that was paying for this program. And, uh, PBS said, well, either he's got to come out or you got to give him back his money. So we gave him back his thousand dollars. But so they're pretty picky about this stuff when they look at it. They'll go through the lists and names and they want to make sure there's no connection to anybody appearing in a show. So I, again, yeah, I, I say that and there are others that are a little standards are a little more relaxed out there in some cases. So got to, you just got to figure out what, you know, where, where your piece lies and how important it is. And, and, uh, whether they can vet it out that way. But PBS, all those rules are in the Red Book standards, so you can find them there. I'd say, uh, you know, any product placement, we run into that. And even if it's not cash, you know, you didn't, the product, you didn't pay cash uh, to the producer to get it included. If it's a trade, you know, hey, I'll give you dinner for three months if you include my you know, restaurant or beverage or whatever, um, that's not allowed. So no product placement of any kind. We had a situation where we were told uh, nobody funded the production and then an executive producer's name looked familiar. Uh, and it turns out, and it's, you know, it's a misunderstanding, but still, there was money provided by an organization who was listed as the executive producer, but really they were funding it. So, yeah. So is that, what about grants? So if they receive grant from maybe a Missouri Historical Society or Arts Council, how does that work? Those are usually pretty clean. Okay. So you don't have too many problems with grant situations like that, unless it's a, you know, unless you're doing a story about the granting organization, then it's a little different. Sure. But they are listed. They are listed oh, yeah. as funding. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. 
we're transparent and, about it. We try to be transparent about all that and list all the funders. And, right, and there's the funding credits, and then it, yeah. within the credits you, of itself of all the activities going on, all the people involved, you have thanks to and those kind of things. So that's where some of the donors are, if they're not the big, big ones. Is that, that how you do it, Michael? Uh, it is sometimes, and and but even those are a problem are problematic. So we have to watch those. So in what way? We, but one thing. Well, one thing we always see is people thanking people who don't need to be thanked. <laughs> so we get a lot of these big giant lists of special thanks to, and it's like, really, that person was in the show. Why are you thanking them? <laughs> you know? Oh, there's, you're thanking them for coming to do an interview. Well, that's not something we thank people for. So, so you know, it's just. You just want to be, you know, above board with all that stuff, and and uh, and I'd say work with whatever station you're in. You know, if you get in the door on somebody, you know, I will always go over that stuff with you. So, is there related to this conversation? It might be important to note, uh, kind of piggyback the idea that public broadcasting stations, unlike commercial stations, are not able to offer, provide, accept paid programming. In other words, if a producer has funding from any of their supporters or themselves that we want to buy airtime, we want to show this kind of this day period time like that, we're unable to do that. Cool. Is there a licensing fee or when you show something, how does that work? And then I understand that once you're on a local station, you can sometimes be eligible to be picked up by other PBS affiliates, is that right? Uh, well, to some extent, that's right. Um, not just because you were on a local station already, but you know, you know, you don't need the local stations to go through NIDA or American Public Television and pitch your show. And and in fact, anymore, I encourage people to just go direct. They have online application processes for finished shows, and those are feeding organizations that feed out all across to PBS stations all across the country. They'll decide if they're interested in your show. They'll vet it out and. Uh, and they have better um, ability to vet things than we do sometimes. You know, they've got lawyers on staff and things like that. So, um, so I oftentimes encourage people who contact me, especially if it's something that I think that will play in a lot of other places. And I say, you know, go, the, go direct first, try them first. Um, uh, you know, and it works oftentimes, you know, they'll, they'll pick them up. They'll, like this recently Santa Fe Trail piece, which I believe probably all of you guys have aired already. Um, the history of the Santa Fe Trail was done by an independent producer out in um, Kansas, middle of Kansas, and uh, and we aired it here first, and uh, but then Nita picked it up and decided to feed it out to everybody, and so I'm I'm, I'm going to guess you'll get some really good coverage with that. I can I I can add to that a lot of um, it seems like we get a lot of independent pr producers that have sort of want to use us as a springboard to a national um, distribution. At, at night in, in St. Louis, we are first and foremost looking for local content for our station. Um, I've had um, producers ask us for their help um, and it ends up being, we. We don't have the staff in St. Louis to help you get your production distributed nationally. As Michael said, you can work directly with NIDA or APT to do that on your own, but um, we are most interested in delivering for our St. Louis audience. That's and our for, priority. And for those things that want to go through NIDA, I mean, one of the reasons why we can just send you direct is because there's a, there's work to be done for those organizations when you get a show that's going to, and and there's cost. So all of a sudden we have to start charging for some of our services to get it in there. And so I always try to send people first through on their own. Right, and I, I put those in the chat for American Public TV and NIDA. Yeah. Uh, National Educational Telecommunications Association. Those are membership, like PBS, they're membership organizations. Each station uh, pay into them. And so that's how they can fund to do what they do on behalf of the stations. So, um, and each one has their own uh, process for independent submissions. So uh, take a look at those links and find out more. And then ask us any questions if we can follow up or, or we'll work with you locally. 
Yeah, it used to be you had to have a presenting station for those things, but they they don't need the presenting stations so much anymore. Sometimes it's nice. There might be some value in a presenting station, so I'm not ruling that out or telling you to stay completely away from that. But but presenting stations have costs associated with this work, and so we usually have to figure out some way to offset that. So. Not only costs, but as Michael mentioned, it's a lot. It's it's very it's a lot of work for the local station and we have small staff. So yeah. to prioritize, we're more interested in working on our internal productions and getting those on the air than we are in helping somebody take their program national. And there's really nothing in it for us financially, maybe some production costs, but on the whole, there's nothing in it for the local station to take it nationally i don't know you guys may disagree with that but the, time well, the, big, time, the big stations charge for that service so you know like uh, gbh and net and those guys you know they they take on a project like that but there's a percentage of the money going right to them to help support their cost and that stuff so and i've seen that be as high as 35 percent. so pretty it can get pretty expensive then a part of it also depends on what you need to do. Do you need to track that program after it's on the air? Do you need ratings from all the markets? Do you, you know, does somebody have to go do all that kind of stuff? And, uh, and also promotion to the station. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's not enough just to have the show there, but uh, someone has to contact somehow each of the stations and say, here's yeah, a show, yeah. it's a beautiful show. Will you air it? And then follow up and did you air it? And so yeah. forth. So, so there, and there's outfits that do that sort of thing uh, professionally. So. And they make and they make a good living at it, and they charge you for that kind of work. So, and maybe so the advantage of the encouragement uh, going to neither APT for producers and all is that uh, it's more streamlined form. They're not going station by station. Uh, you're with an organization that will uh, promote your program, that will distribute your program, that all of us will then be aware of its availability. It doesn't hurt that uh, in your local area, if you choose to contact the station, again, because of the local connection, say, hey, this is available for NEDA or APT, that's certainly helpful. But uh, really for wider and easier and economic distribution for the producers, uh, going with one of these organizations really is uh, the best advice rather than going independent stations, not independent stations, but independently to yeah. stations. Very good. So for with your internal projects, do you ever hire freelance or is that all in staff people? Uh, we do hire freelance people from time to time. So we don't we don't keep the kind of staff that we once did um, on the production side. So we have some production staff and and they're chasing uh, projects that, you know, we've got a weekly couple of weekly. We got one weekly show and a monthly show right now. And uh, so we have staff working on those and uh, they're, they're station kind of commitments. But but we. Um, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, we we. Um, uh, you know, we do we do hire freelancers from time to time, and like I said, we're working with a producer here in town right now, making a, a piece on guns. And so, you know, we're not we're not opposed to using freelancers, but it, that's always the question of do we have the budget to do it? So um, that is always the question on everything <laughs> there is is what is the budget? So yeah. um, and over the years, I can think of all kinds of times like I used I hired Charles Guswell from the Star to write projects for us. And, uh, and be the face of things and so there's all kinds of ways to use freelance people um, but it just depends on your kind of your organization's philosophy um, and ours has been recently to not have so many full-time producers and to use more freelancers so i would say the same in st louis yeah we we use a lot of freelance um not producers shooters um various we use a lot of freelance people we we're on a university campus so we depend on the students because it's a hands-on learning environment for them so we don't really uh, use freelance and tom aren't you on a campus as well yes and as you mentioned we use students um 
you know, I mentioned earlier that these kinds of programs are uh, local programming history, things like that are a priority of the station. So we do dedicate, uh, like you all, we have limited staff, but we do try and dedicate those individuals to the projects uh, as much as possible. We do uh, from time to time uh, benefit from freelance help and all. So uh, yes, those opportunities are there. What is the best way for freelance to reach out? Is there a, a, a formal way or do you suggest they just email you? How does that work? Well, for us, it's nice to have a relationship first. And so we go after, we, we, we seek out when we need somebody. So we know them, you know, you know who some of the producers are in your market. Sometimes they've worked here before. And so that's how we do it. Cool. I wonder if that's something that uh, through the film commission could be help coordinated that, you know, here, here are all these, you know, possible talents, help, things like that. Um, that would be helpful for us accessing. Uh, we do get uh, what I would call cold calls, mm -hmm. individuals um, often uh, voiceover talent, uh, seeing what our needs might be. And it might be an email, it might be a phone call, a demonstration link or something like that. Uh, but that's not unusual to receive that kind of um, application, I guess. Yeah. Wonderful. And it is something initially when we had, when I reached out and we started having this conversation about how the film office can help assist you guys a little bit more. Um, we're talking about like through film festivals. And I'm glad you mentioned, Peggy, that sometimes you find things through local film festivals and how can my office help? Because we have 20 film festivals across the state. There's a lot of local work happening, kind of just tying people together. So thank you for mentioning that, Tom. That is something we are working on. And this is just the first step in that direction. And having you guys be accessible today to some of the filmmakers across the state is hugely helpful. All of these resources, if you haven't copied the links in the chat, please do so, you guys. Those are great. Any other questions in the chat? I think we are, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll take some um, audience uh, questions. Um, last, you've given lots of advice to filmmakers, and I, I think this has been really good stuff. Any last advice that you have it, that you would give to those folks here that are wanting to pitch you shows or are thinking about shows that maybe could, could be something for you guys? Read the guidelines. <laughs> Read the red book. <laughs> Uh, have everything in a nice, tidy package, you know, promos, um, description, images, all of that. Um, and we want to see it. So definitely share it with us and um, follow the technical specs as well. Is there a link to the Red Book? I think yes. Yes. At I the top. It. Yeah. Yep. That's the about producing for for Kansas City PBS. Is it under there? Yep. It's a, I think it's a third link from the very top. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's one of those up there. They all kind of go back to the same thing on PBS's website. But the okay. bottom of PBS's splash page, it just says producing for PBS. You can find all these things in there for the most yeah. part, except for our local one. So, yeah, so it's at the KCPT site. Yeah, there's one at KCPT.org, and that's for locals. You know, if you're pitching something just, just for air here locally, that's all you need to do there. Okay. And then well, I, you know, the other thing I'd point out, because a lot of you guys are documentary makers, I think, and make, I know some amazing stuff. Um, ITVS has a program for funding that you can apply through online, um, uh, POV has an online application process. Now, POV wants to see finished projects. They don't really want to see stuff too early on. Um, but ITVS likes to see things early on that they can actually get involved in and, and hold a little editorial uh, uh, possibility with. So, and IDA, I believe that IDA has a program now, and uh, Independent Documentary Association. So these are all other reference, you know, or uh, resources for you. Um, and in fact, IDA has all kinds of, you know, resources, contracts, things like that, I think you can look at. I haven't looked at their site for a while, but they used to have all that stuff. So, um, and that may be of use, so. 
and there's but, another one for um, Firelight Media. Michael is, is let me. I get the link to that. They do. It's good. Uh, they're working with PBS on getting getting the producers of color their work, getting help with their productions and help with distribution of their programs. So yeah. I will put that up here. Yeah, Great, thank you. That's a good one. They're just getting off the ground on that in the last couple of years. Of course, they have a great track record of making things. So yeah, so they work with it is Stanley Nelson and yeah, Stanley Nelson's group. Yeah. Such good information. Thank you, thank you, uh, Steph. You had a question. I was wondering. Um, you're you're around the state, and once in a while, things that Andrea and I do are assist people with locations. Are the studio spaces that you work in, are those available for rent or available to be used as a location by outside by non-PBSers? Uh, in Kansas City, they are. We rent them from time to time. We have two studios here, one big one and one smaller one. And, and, and people use those from time to time. You know, and that's on a case by case basis. We have to figure out if we can slide it into our own schedule. Um, which really we're just producing two regular shows in there. So we usually have some room, some capacity. Um, and in our case, it's an older studio, but it works pretty well. So yeah, we always take those on. And uh, we have a production manager who would deal with that. I, I don't deal with that area, but you know, it's just a rental basis. You know, you can rent it for the day, you can rent it for a half day, you can rent anything, so. Okay, good to know, thank you. De definitely in St. Louis. Um, I believe we have the largest studio in the city. I think we are bigger than the commercial. I think I'm right when I say that. Um, go we, with rent it, go with <laughs> we rent it for um, productions. We also use it as an event space, both for us and for outside groups. And it's a fun, it's a fun space. So it is definitely uh, for rent. And as Michael said, we have a production person that handles it, but I can certainly put anybody in touch with them. And we've, we've not in the past, but I think maybe once or twice. So uh, if you have something specific, you can give us a call. But, yeah. We used to do a lot of uplinks, but that business sort of dried up with the internet. So. Awesome. Um, there's one question in the chat and then I'll get to you, Tom. Good to see you, Tom. Uh, oh, now the chat's blown up. So I didn't, um, the question about narrative versus doc programming. Is there, are, you said there's not all, it's not always just docs, but what kind of narrative, dramatic, non-fictional uh, work? Do you, do you see any of those projects? In terms of dramas? Yeah. I, I've seen some here and I've aired several in the last couple of years. Um, the Tree, I think some stations might have picked that up, and uh, um, I'm trying to think of the other, the land. The land. <laughs> yeah, I did. We we picked up both of those. In fact, I think Joycey, I think I heard Joycey Pelt just passed. She so, did, yeah. 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 Gotcha. So, um, what was it about those specific projects? That they were interesting like? story bits of storytelling, and they were well done. They were produced well, and you know, uh, we were. We were game to give them a try. They they had all kinds of local, uh, you know, uh, location work, pe places people would recognize in the background. So I think Kansas Cityans love that kind of stuff. And uh, we also just recently ran Terminal, which was a six part series that the produced some local producers here in town have been working on for some time. And and I ran that whole thing. Uh, unfortunately, it ran a, a, against something. I forget what it was up against. It kind of poorly but um, i'll get that back on here one of these days so yeah we look for we'll look at anything so um there's a really great filmmaker in the region out of lawrence who's who's been pitching a notion for um uh you know something said in the jazz era you know we're involving the baseball teams and who knows if that'll ever come to pass but you know i'd be happy to consider stuff like that so so not no so nudity, no nudity, no, <laughs> no, no bad language. Don't no talk bad language, no nudity. <laughs> I just, just got in trouble. I just got spanked for something I put on for Masterpiece. So, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> He's not yeah. going to tell us what, why. Oh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, haven't even, I haven't even started down this road, but you know, people are convinced that. that Downton Abbey got a little steamy sometimes. So, 
It did, and Masterpiece yeah. gets a little steamy from time to time. And uh, Well, not like they used to, though. <laughs> yeah, not like they used to back in the old days when they, you know, they ran Steam Bath, which was total nudity, full frontal. So, what? yeah, back before the FCC was so, actually, there were two films, two projects that, I can't remember the name of the other one. Do you remember, Michael? It always comes up. People always snicker about it. Was it Small today. Flanders? Yeah, it might or, have been. Or um, Madame Bovary, you know, that's not the one. Lady mm. Chatterley's Sliver, probably. Yeah, that might have been it. But Steam Bath was a... was a, That was just before we went on about. the air, I think. It came almost went on the air in 1979. So a couple of these things happened before we went on. Yeah. So strictly docs for you in St. Louis, Peggy? Not strictly docs, but I would say that our viewers respond bond more to local docs uh they love them um but we would absolutely look at anything but sure if it's a if it's a historical drama okay. that would be a st louis historical drama that would be ideal yeah great great tom did you have a question no, I, I would just uh, agree and say again, emphasize historical documents. Uh, there's been mention of music or art programs. Uh, certainly we're open to those. It would be uh, absolutely open to dramas or something. It's not something that we uh, have experience or background with those being provided locally, but uh, certainly would consider them. Very good, very good. Tom Bellows, you have your hand raised, please. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you guys for taking the time and for, for pulling this together. This is uh, uh, not only a great resource, but all you guys uh, are giving some great information. Um, I'm working uh, currently on a documentary, a historical documentary uh, based in St. Louis. It's mostly uh, St. Louis centric. Uh, a couple questions based on that, which is, would uh, the other uh, territories be interested in what is the St. Louis centric documentary. That's one. And second, aside from our own, certainly PBS station, which, uh, which I hope to approach, but, uh, and second, it's, um, it's in conjunction with the University of Missouri, St. Louis, they are funding it. Uh, I'm I've been hired to produce it for them. And I don't know if that is something that raises a red flag with you guys with regard to an organization, even though it's an educational 501c3, you know, it's an educational uh, outlet, if that's something that uh, raises a red flag or if that's, uh, you know, something that you are looking for. As long as the chancellor's not the star of the show. No, um, <laughs> no, that, that in itself doesn't raise a flag. Or, well, or if it's about if it's about UMSL, then and they're funding it, then that yeah, won't work. That's, that's yeah. a different ball. It, it's, it's, it's not. It's about the Greeks of St. Louis, the Greek community of St. Louis. There's a Greek studies program uh, at the university, and uh, the head of that Greek studies program uh, thought at some point before he retires, whether that's a year or 10 years from now, thought it might be a good idea to actually cull some of what is already in their oral history archives and to have some sort of finished product that will talk about that history that is slowly going away because the firsthand accounts are disappearing. And it was something that I would consider doing 20 years ago. Uh, I've been a producer for a long time from St. Louis originally. I left, came back, and I was approached to do this idea that I thought about doing 20 years ago. So I thought, well, this is great. And sure enough, I'd seen the hill as well. And I was uh, encouraged by that, had a chance to speak with one of the filmmakers as well. Um, they, you know, it uh, um, is a good piece and, and I hope to do something at least somewhat uh, reflective of that, but different. Uh, that said, you know, it's uh, not promotional of the university per se, but that Greek studies head, head was th talking about maybe being on it as well and then we have a historian and an anthropologist that have been uh, work, that have worked at the university that i've they've been my, uh, very helpful in putting together what is that historical timeline and i thought well they would be great interviews as well if they're in it and on it <laughs> is that a problem that's sort of my my bigger question like in other words am i gonna have to make a cut that doesn't include them 
or discussion of a Greek studies program that exists at the university. I know this is a lot, but it's, it's, we're at that point. Yeah, this is when it gets tricky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who, 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 who then ultimately makes that decision? Is it you guys? Is it PBS? Is it the program directors themselves? Well, I can tell you that PBS would not probably cotton to that relationship. So, um, okay. Uh, but it would be for us, it'd be a little different case by case basis. We might look at it and, and think, well, how much, uh, you know, if you go back and actually one of those links is to the co production guidelines that I, I sent to you guys, and you'll, you'll okay. see that the way that PBS tests those kinds of things do they have any influence over the program? Do they generally share in funding and the risks of production? You know, blah, blah, blah. They got a bunch of rules that they look at. And, uh, and I'll say that PBS has has uh, lightened these uh, things up. For instance, and I'll just point at Ken, uh, Ken Burns Project, the National Parks. About twenty percent of that funding came from the National Parks Foundation, which so it tells you that PBS is willing to look at things and say, "Yeah, how much editorial control did they exercise? Did did they request their own people be interviewed? You know." they're going to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and they're going to be tougher on a national distribution than we might be locally and your other part of your question was about airing other things yeah i loved airing the hill from st louis that did very well for, in this market uh, yeah. okay. it's a great little piece and did well and now we're pledging it so that's good for us and uh, and then i've had other shows that you think would do really well i think ted williams wasn't that a st louis show I'm trying to remember where that one came from. Was, uh, american experience i think yeah, but but the now yeah, maybe I'm thinking of Stan Musial. There was some, Stan was Stan Musial yeah. shut out of St. Louis. Did terrible for us. So you know, I, I would thought I thought well, this is a no brainer. Everybody will love that. Loves baseball. Didn't care a bit. So just case by case. But yeah, I look for stuff I, all that's all out of the region. I, I'll take stuff out sure, of yeah. Kansas and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Iowa and Nebraska. I'm happy to look at yeah. stuff. Same, same with us. Same here. Sue, you mentioned a project in the chat. Do you want to, and I know that's similar to the question that was just asked, but I wanted to give you the opportunity. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I had a film air a number of years ago with Michael, uh, Kansas City Jazz and Blues, Past, Present, and Future. Yep. And I, uh, first of all, wondering if um, the other stations would have interest in it in Missouri. And then now I have a film called Original Jayhawker about the history of Mound City, Kansas, which, as I said in the chat, dates back to John Brown and um, the Civil War. And I'm wondering if Missouri would have interest in looking at that as well. Well, I'll answer that for me. I can't answer that for anybody else. Yes, yeah, I owe you a call back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and oddly enough, um, your stuff comes up with a weird email that says uh, that this is a this does not look safe. So okay. I don't know why, because that I, I went to look at it. I couldn't remember the name of your jazz and blues thing. I remember yeah. I saw you up there. City Jazz and Blues, Past, Present, and Future had a long yeah. title. And I did air that. So, you did, yeah. Uh, that's, that's I lost kind of track of this other one here. Those programs might partner well with, you know, we could put them in with some other programs. Uh, with the, um, especially the jazz thing. We have some other jazz programs and we have a jazz in Columbia that, that uh, we partner with every now and then. Yeah. That'd be yeah. great if I, if I can get contact information from everyone um, or drop that in the chat, that'd be great. I'd reach out to you. Yeah, I put mine Thanks. in earlier. So. Thanks guys, yeah. There's mine, sorry, yep. I should have put it there earlier. Um, I, I, wanted to go, I wanted to go back to the funding um, question of the unsolved funding thing. So our, our final question usually is the perception test is, you know, if we're not sure whether or not the funding interferes with the content or we're, we're pretty sure that it doesn't, it's clean, but it's the perception that matters. So if our viewers perceive that we received money to air the program or produce the program, then uh, we'll, we won't air it. So even though, even if it on paper is clean, if the perception is that it's not, then yeah. we will probably not air it. If that, hopefully that makes sense. It's all about perception. 
That's actually PBS's rule is about the perception. Yeah, and we follow PBS guidelines um, very closely. Good, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Monica, you had a question? Oh, are you driving? Hello. I was on mute. I'm okay. sorry. How if are you're you driving, all? you're scaring me. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to get off of mute. But uh, thank you so much, Missouri Film Office and everybody who put all this together. This is great information. But, you know, I would be remiss not to say what I'm working on. I'm working on a documentary film uh, in reference to gospel music, the history of gospel music then and now, along with also trying to open up a gospel music hall of fame here in the St. Louis area. Um, I uh, uh, unfortunately don't always have information about resources to help me with projects and things of that sort as a television and film producer, but um, I'm loving the information just to see that these type of doors and opportunities are available for us. And, and so I guess my last question and my only question is, would you all have an interest at PBS for the Gospel Music Hall of Fame uh, then and now documentary? Okay, so uh, maybe I'll take that one first, at least I um, would definitely have an interest in it, uh, airing that kind of a program. I can also tell you that there are two producers in this region already working on that same sort of a documentary. But I believe their, their bit is gospel music here in town only. So, so uh, you may have crossed paths with them and I can't think of their names right now, but um, we did actually turn their production down for one reason or another, I can't remember why. Uh, but um, just so you know, you might want to talk to them because they're working on the same sort of a doc. So we we'd would be interested. Yeah. yeah, we'd be interested in seeing it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, if you turned it down, I, do I really want to talk to them? <laughs> no, no, we actually we turned it down for for they wanted us to fund it. And we just oh, went, okay. we I putting money into the funding. That was the issue there. Okay, well, maybe you could connect us. I would yeah. love to. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, they were, they were, they'd been shooting, they had an interesting bunch of stuff already. They've been shooting for 10 years. So part of their footage is completely out of date at this point. So, but anyway, I'll be happy well, to try to hook you up. So. And Steph, one thing, maybe Steph knows too. I don't know. One thing I, important that I wanted to mention was that we, like um, Kansas City, just hired a chief um, content officer for the first time. So I'm really, uh, I sort of covered things for a few years. Um, her name is Aja Williams. She really is going to be the contact going forward. She and I are working closely together right now um, because she really just started a couple of weeks ago. So I will put her con name and contact number or contact information in the chat. She's going to be the contact, but I will be sort of still meddling in it for a while. <laughs> Transitioning, I think they say, yes. That's right, <laughs> transitioning. Uh, wonderful. Ben, you have a question? Hi. Yeah. So uh, thanks, guys, for putting this on. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm a uh, St. Louis Metro um, writer, director, producer, and I have a client of mine who is a not for profit in the region. They're an international um, not for profit that's growing exponentially. And one of my recent pitches to them was to do a documentary form production. Um, in order to, you know, generate interest for the nonprofit. So that's obviously the ulterior motive, but also just because they have a very unique and interesting story. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, when we talk about all the funding stipulations and stuff, and you mentioned the uh, perception test, which I totally understand all of that, but would it be inbounds for them to fund a documentary and then basically completely hand it over to me as the storyteller um, to share a documentary that was, um, you know, basically unbiased and a real look at their organization. Uh, because believe it or not, even though they're my client, they, they fully want to hand over the editorial control. So I'm just wondering if there's any like, you know, um, caveats I should be aware of with that, if I, if I should submit it to uh, PBS or any of these others links that you guys uh, mentioned or if it's out of bounds. 
That's another tricky one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would certainly say we would have a look at it in St. Louis, but again, perception's going to be everything. Uh, we'll need, we'll look at it, but it's, it's tricky. Sure. Yeah. And, and you're still in production or pre-production? Uh, pre-production. The production is going to be pretty, pretty fast because they, they want it done before Labor Day for their annual conference. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun in the next few months, but it's going to be <laughs> very fast. I, feel, I would recommend still going to read the co-production guidelines on that sure. TV site. So because um, they've got a bunch of tests they want to run through on these kinds of things. But I would think that that's going to be a trouble. And it's going to raise some trouble for you. Yeah, I, I don't think the average audience member would think, well, you're telling a story about this organization who gave money, even though you had the control. It's, it's mm -hmm. still the... Yeah. Always a fine line. It looks like, it, then it seems like a paid program. Right, right. And, you know, I, I, I'm aware that that could be the perception that it's like, you know, sponsored by these people. Um, I actually did have a second question, if that's okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so I actually have a, a ton of narrative short film content that has aired on other forms of uh, public media. Um, we were talking about narrative content uh, previously and potentially like, you know, in some fundraising caveats and stuff like that. I am actually in the uh, screenwriting phase for a passion project that's about 16 pages. Is there anyone in the PBS world that would be interested in seeing the script before I move into pre-production? Because there's a lot of resources that I would need with regard to, um, you know, like studio space and stuff like that. And the film is about two thirds funded already. Um, so it's gonna be mid five figures-ish. Um, and I just wondered if there would be any interest from any of the PBS folk about that. These are shorts you're making? I, I, I think you lost me in there. These sure. Pieces uh, of I, short content, you said? Yes. Yeah. Two minutes, one minute, three minutes? Uh, short film. So it'd be closer to 16 minutes. 16 and then minutes. I, yes. And I have an existing piece that's 2301, yeah. um, but I believe could be with like editorial, like director statement, um, meet the 2646 mark easily. Um, so I guess my question is like, would there be inter any interest in seeing the previous piece that's been aired publicly before um, on the uh, HEC TV uh, locally in St. Louis? And so that's the first part. And the second part would be, would there be any, any interest in reading a screenplay that has to do with the St. Louis region or the, uh, I guess I should say metropolitan uh, Missouri regions? So it's not a documentary, it's a... Correct, it's a, it's okay. a um, man, I don't even know what to call it. It's not a historical, it's not a historical narrative. It's a current times narrative. Um, it largely has to do with the protests that have occurred um, throughout the nation regarding Black Lives Matter. Uh, well, re regarding the length, uh, if you wanna share the 23 minute one that we could have a look at that. Um, occasionally we, we need, actually we need filler pretty regularly, um, but 16 minutes is a little long for filler. We normally use shorter filler, but it's usually more documentary style shorts than um, dramatic shorts or I don't know, fiction. I don't know the word I'm looking for. Um, so, and it would, again, it would need to be about St. Louis. I don't normally read screenplays, so I don't know that that would do you much good. Yeah, same but, here. But I, I, I will always look at content and I'm not afraid of short things. I, there are all kinds of spots in a schedule where, where you can slide in things that are odd links, um, you know, if they're, if it's the right piece. So it sounds like this is more St. Louis specific, but if I had pieces like that for about things in Kansas City, I might be able to use them. Uh, I mean, for instance, a lot of the BBC content that we buy and 
British shows and things come in at odd lengths because they cut the commercials out of them. And so they come in really short. We end up needing to fill 12 minutes or 14 minutes or, and I love stuff like that. That's local that I can use in those kinds of places. So we don't, we don't pay for those, you know, normally. So that's, and, and the, I'm sure the bottom line is, is how to get paid for this stuff. And I always tell people, you got to figure that out on your own. Cause if you're coming to us thinking that you're going to make your money back, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. So um, it's good to have a plan going in on how to pay for things. So do you, and I would think places play festivals and things first before that they, I mean, it's kind of, and you're fine with that. It sounds like yeah. so in having an audience a little bit already helps a little bit too. Yeah. No. Yep. No, I'm happy with that. I always tell people when they bring me stuff, you, you, if you're wanting this in the festival circuit, you should go do that first. Cause I've always been told that once you have a broadcast date, the festival circuit's not as interested in you. So, yeah. so, um, and then the nice thing about when getting a broadcast date eventually is it does make you eligible for the Emmys. So you can, you know, apply for the Emmys if you've had a broadcast date. Yeah. Regional yeah. Emmys, yeah. Regional Emmys, which are always nice for people's, um, you know, just to have. Yeah. Um, they're very pretty. Yes. They're they very are. pretty. <laughs> they fit the case very well. This has been wonderful, wonderful. Anything, last thoughts from our panelists before we maybe break into some breakout rooms for a few minutes? Any last advice? We've had some really great questions. All right, if you guys can stick with us a little longer, we're going to break into breakouts. Those of you, I would hope that you would stick around. This is a kind of a cool part where we're mixing people together from all over the state and different disciplines. So it's just 10 minutes and we'll have you a little bit of rules. Um, just do a quick little intro first to go around the circle. And then my question is going to be um, any if you want to share a project that you're working on just a project no, let's not get too crazy in these rooms we only have 10 minutes so i'm going to break you into your first set of breakout rooms um ready the magic of the computer zoom here um see you all in a few minutes Okay, did you guys, okay. All right.